Okay, so I've recently arrived in Victoria uh, on the 1st of March to um, help out with the establishing of, of the new monastery at uh, Newbury, uh, which is uh, just up in the Central Highlands, about an hour from uh, uh, about an hour from the airport at Tullamarine. And uh, uh, while I was there, I uh, got an invitation to come out, come here and teach. So that was very kind. Um, uh, I think often, uh, often Ajahn Brahm's monks, when they're helping out at Newbury, come here. So um, um, I was asked to uh, give the topic of the talk today, and uh, <laughs> I decided that uh, um, there was a, there was a short quote that I like, and I thought it would make a good theme for the talk today. And just so everyone who's watching here in the room and uh, on the internet, I am doing this sort of Ajahn Chah style. So, in Ajahn Chah's tradition, uh, the monks will uh, give their talk, you know, pretty much, um, pretty much improvised, pretty much from the heart, rather than uh, reading off a script. But I did have a, a theme to start with. So, uh, I'd like to start with a quote from from Ernest Hemingway. And uh, Mr. Hemingway said, if you are lucky enough to have lived in Paris as a young man, then wherever you go for the rest of your life, it stays with you, for Paris is a movable feast. <laughs> that was the, uh, the title given to his autobi autobiography, published posthumously. And uh, Hemingway was a, uh, a young man in the 20s, 1920s, and he was actually very poor at the time. Uh, he was living there with his wife, his first wife. Um, but he was very, it was a very formative. Uh, they were his formative years as a writer. But uh, but I really like this idea of a movable feast. These th this this thing that you carry with you wherever you go. Um, <laughs> uh, and and the reason this is interesting to me is because. Uh, over the years, and uh, I've just turned 40. I turned 40 last year. I'm coming up to uh, 41 in June. And uh, in that time, I spent a lot of time just not so much travelling, but I've spent spent my life in a number of different places. Um, starting with uh, Perth in my mummy's tummy. <laughs> my mum and dad met in Perth, but. Um, and got married there, but when Mum was pregnant, she decided to. They both decided to move to Sydney. Um, so uh, Dad caught the plane, and Mum was a bit worried about the airplane, so she went across on the uh, Indian Pacific <laughs> on the train and uh, tell stories of uh, you know, breakfast. There was cooked on the potbelly stove on the on the on the train, and uh, but eventually she made it to uh, Sydney, where I was delivered. Uh, Paddington Hospital, which is not there anymore, but it's, Paddington's still there. And uh, and I uh, lived on a, a street called Cope Street, which was this uh, just little little uh, uh, little sort of lane in uh, near Lane Cove in in Sydney. And uh, my, I had uh, I was fortunate enough to have a few play friends in that street. And uh, the reason I mention all this is because one of those play, play friends came to visit me today. That's Rasika. <laughs> I haven't seen her since 1996, but uh, she's now married to a Sri Lankan and her son comes to Dharma School. He wanted to com come to the talk today, but we said, oh, it's a bit, bit, bit of an adult's business. So. But, um, yeah, but those, those, I remember those days very uh, in, in the way you remember the, the life of a small child that you once were. And uh, I managed to... Uh, uh, stay in Sydney till I was about 19 uh, in, in 1996 uh, and at that time my family were moving over to Perth and I went with them and uh, studied software engineering there. I was a programmer there as, um, as Adrian mentioned and uh, so I lived there and I lived in Perth and studied uh, software engineering and then I moved to Melbourne after, my, after I finished my degree. Uh, I was looking for uh, yeah, well, I, I, I basically came over because I'd met a girl on the internet. So, <laughs> as these things go. Anyway, we ended up living together for four years and were married for 13 months of those. But <laughs> 15 months, that was a lot. But, uh, but uh, uh, that, was, that, was, that was between uh, 2001, 2005. And 
at that point I was living in uh, living in uh, uh, Melbourne I was living in Seddon I don't know if you know it it's kind of it's got a station and I think it has two streets but it's wedged between Yarraville, Yarraville and Footscray so um, anyway so I was, I was living there and eventually uh, yeah my, my uh, I was uh, I had a fair bit of dukkha in my life at that stage. I'd broken up with my wife and I was living alone in Seddon. Well, not alone, I had a, had a housemate and, uh, and a dog. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I, just as a lot of people do, and uh, Rasika's son I decided, I asked the, the, the old familiar question, why did you become a monk? And basically because, you know, because I didn't say to it because he's only eight years old, but uh, suffering is kind of <laughs> the big thing, right? So uh, you're stressed out and separated from your wife and kind of lonely here in, in Melbourne, didn't have a lot of friends, didn't have a temple to go to at that stage. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't Buddhist at that stage, but I was uh, uh, interested in sort of, you know, I had quite a stressful job working hard as a programmer and I got uh, interested in... Uh, Meditation, so I thought, oh, I want to, want to relax. I'm going to do some meditation, <laughs> and uh, uh, so uh, I do what any uh, any person does this in this day and age. I googled it and <laughs> came across the uh, the basic method of meditation by Ajahn Brahm, and uh, I thought, wow, this stuff's really cool. And uh, I started practicing meditation in my in my house in uh, in Seddon, and. Uh, uh, at that point, I was uh, I had a six-month contract as a programmer at the at the business I was at. So I uh, um, that um, contract was up, and my lease was up on the same day. So I thought, well, this is auspicious. So uh, at this time, I'd, I'd heard a few Dhamma talks as well, listening listening to them live. Well, not live like this. I don't think the um, the IT setup was quite as, as sophisticated as it is now. Um, a lot of people didn't have uh, internet connections back then that were quite fast enough for sort of streaming video, that sort of thing, but um, definitely the talks uh, by Ajahn Brahm uh, given on a Friday night were available on the, on the web. You could just download them and have a listen. Um, so, yeah, I'm like, wow, this is really weird. You know, this, this really cool teacher is uh, living where my family are. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I ended my contract and... Uh, Packed up and moved back to Perth. Yeah, and again, there's this theme of just moving on, moving on. Uh, so back in Perth, back in Perth, I uh, started. Uh, well, the first thing I wanted to do was to go to visit uh, Damaloka because I'd heard so much about it and I'd seen photos and stuff. Damaloka, for those who don't know, is the uh, Buddhist Society of Western Australia's city temple. Uh, it's actually just a little bit north of Perth, not very far, maybe 10 minutes north of Perth. So um, I really wanted to go there and check it out. And uh, for a guy who's feeling pretty lonely uh, and you want to get away from you know, trying to find uh, company in bars and nightclubs and or even cafes or whatever <laughs> it just doesn't happen really so uh, yeah it was it's a, it, it, transport wasn't all that easy but I managed to I think I, I think I walked there the first time it's about eight kilometers from my parents place uh, but not a, not an unpleasant walk and I just found the community there was just so wonderful uh, it was so nice to have uh, a group of people there who were uh, just uh, Genuinely friendly, genuinely kind, and uh, there are people who'd been supporting that that uh, Buddhist society since the 70s, um, have been you know practicing meditation and listening to good talks from the various monks, including Ajahn Brahm when he came along, Ajahn Jagara before him. Uh, I was looking at the website for the BSV, and I think you've been here much longer than that. <laughs> so <laughs> there's a fair bit of history here. I think it's uh, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, um, yeah, I, I came to a, I think it was my first Dhamma talk with uh, a monk called Ajahn Chandako, and he is in uh, New Zealand now, but uh, uh, I just listened to one talk and I thought, wow, this is just so, so amazing, you know, <laughs> this is, this is uh, not, not what I've come to expect from religion, you know, <laughs> um, 
you know, having only experienced mostly uh, Christianity uh, as a dominant religion in this country. Um, so yeah, ordained, and uh, shortly after, I went to. I, I think the monks suggested doing a nine-day retreat, so I did one with Ashan Chatamalo, uh, and then shortly after, in two thousand six, went to the monastery, and uh, I was living there. Uh, I, uh, I kind of made the determination, um, and it was something that Ajahn, Brahm, Ajahn, Ajahn Chah recommended, which is to do, uh, spend five rains as a bhikkhu before you uh, go travelling uh, in, in Thailand. They call it going on Tudong. Uh, the monks used to go just originally wandering in the, in the jungles from village to village, from monastery to monastery. So. But, at, um, but I managed to sit tight for uh, up until my fifth rains and uh, didn't really go anywhere. I, I had a brief... Uh, a uh, trip to Sri Lanka and Thailand as, as part of a pilgrimage, mostly in Sri Lanka. Uh, and that was uh, very interesting. I remember uh, seeing some of the holy sites and they're very impressive. But I also remember the uh, Buddhist Society, uh, the um, Buddhist Publication Society there, the BPS, in Kandy. Uh, you'll probably see a lot of, uh, in, any Buddhist, uh, in any Buddhist library, you'll probably find a lot of books and pamphlets and stuff from the, um, from the BPS. And uh, and the nice thing, it had just had such a nice vibe that place. It had a sort of uh, uh, sort of energy to it. People just going around and uh, I don't know what they were doing, but there, <laughs> there was just a general uh, vibe of of uh, activity there. And uh, and the best part about all that was uh, being able to meet with some of the resident monks that that had uh, come to the. Uh, to, uh, to the BPS that day, so I met, uh, I think, uh, was it Ajahn Guttasila? I think that's his name. Very uh, large uh, New Zealand monk and uh, Ajahn Dirawangso. And, uh, and uh, after that I thought, well, I'd really like to uh, come back to uh, Sri Lanka one day and meet, uh, meet more monks. Because as, as inspiring as all the teachers, are, uh, all the uh, uh, statues and uh, holy sites are. It's uh, it's the living sangha there that was uh, uh, really inspired me. Um, so uh, in uh, 2013, I'd done my fifth rains. Excuse me, Let's shift my leg. Oh, there we go. Uh, 2014, yeah. So I decided to. 2013, 2013, <laughs> okay, here we go. So moving on again, this, this theme of moving on, moving on. Uh, the first thing I did when I hadn't had my chance to go and travel after my fifth rains in 2013 was to go to Wat Buddha Dharma, uh, which is a monastery up in uh, just north of Wiseman's Ferry in New South Wales. And I spent three months there with um, Ajahn Kamavaro, Ajahn Santuti, and a uh, monk called Venerable Pasarka, who's... Uh, uh, not in robes anymore, but he's still in touch. And uh, that was just a short stay and went back to the monastery and spent, and then headed off to Sri Lanka for four months, which was wonderful. So I spent my, my reigns in, um, in, in Sri Lanka in a mo monastery called Nawayana uh, with Bhante Aryananda there, and I spent four months there and met many, very many nice monks. There are a lot of monks there, maybe. 110 monks. <laughs> uh, finally came back and uh, uh, back to Australia. Spent another just over a year with Ajahn Kamer again and uh, got back to Perth. Uh, and I was there for a couple of years before coming here, before coming to uh, Victoria, which I hadn't seen since 2005. So that's sort of the, <laughs> the roundabout travel that I've been doing over the years. and. Uh, um, and the question comes back to that old quote of Hemingway, you know, what is it that you carry with you all around? And, uh, uh, well, well, we carry our minds around, really. <laughs> we carry around, uh, more than that, uh, we carry around, there's this uh, term in the, in the suttas, bhavana, which is the uh, development is often translated as, and uh, um, uh, essentially it's summed up with the uh, with the eightfold path, with the 
37 wings to uh, awakening, but essentially it's just this whole collection of uh, mental qualities that we cultivate over the years. Uh, and it means that when we go from place to place, uh, whether they're uh, places we've never been before or whether they're places we have visited before but which <laughs> have changed remarkably, like Melbourne from 2005 to today <laughs> or yesterday. I did come in on the Westgate, Westgate Bridge yesterday and I, I, I wondered where Melbourne was and I realised it had just been swallowed up <laughs> by the rest of Melbourne. Uh, it, uh, it's, it's, for not, it's amazing coming back after such a long time to see the change, to see the change in the places. And of course, when I went to, back to New South Wales, I had the same experience. You know, the places you've been um, aren't the places you visited before. The, some of the old buildings are there, there are many new buildings, but maybe the, new bu the old buildings don't have the same people in them. It's just, uh, it's, it's all subject to a nature. But this, uh, these qualities of mind, you know, I, I, I mean, Ajahn Brahm's uh, great uh, uh, translation of the Samasankapa, the right intention to make peace, be kind, be gentle. And when you make peace, you, you're not just, uh, it's not just an action in the present moment, but it's also a, an, a habit, a quality of mind that you're, you're cultivating. Um, and the more you practice, uh, making peace, uh, the more it's there for you when you need it, when you're in a strange place, maybe uh, uh, a nice comfortable place like this hall. I haven't been to this hall before, but it uh, seems very, uh, very nice, very, uh, very clean and tidy and very beautiful Buddha Rupa and a uh, uh, nice group of people here. I don't know how many people here, what, 50 people or something? Quite a few, yeah. So it's, very, it's, it's great to see a nice crowd like this and my old friends like Rasika and uh, I see Conrad's there as well. We're going to have a quick chat after. <laughs> uh, we, see, we, we know each other from, uh, from Bodhinyana. Um, <coughs> never mind. <laughs> yes, the winds are up, the winds are up. Um, Yeah, so when, as you cultivate this, this sense of peace, so you come to a new place like this, which is pleasant, or you come to a place which is uh, ch scary or challenging, or uh, all these sorts of things. But the mind has that; the mind knows what to do. It, it has that. Uh, um, it has the, the. It has that quality that uh, is is ready whenever you need it. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's part of your movable, movable feast <laughs> that you carry around with you. And of course, Ajahn Brahm also talks about the, uh, the kindness, or sometimes he talks about it as uh, kindfulness, where he combines uh, mindfulness and, uh, uh, and, and metta together. Uh, and again, you know, if you have that quality of metta in your mind, or at least that... Uh, uh, latent intention, that um, underlying drive to, to be kind to the people you're with um, and to people far away, uh, then when you really need it, you're in a situation which might be quite heated, might be quite uncomfortable, but the, uh, the meta is there and it's great, it can just transform those situations. Um, uh, and of course, Ajahn Brahm talks about the gentleness as well. Uh, which is uh, uh, important with people, but also with your own mind. <laughs> when you uh, when you sit and meditate, and uh, you know there's this uh, uh, you know, strong wind outside, blowing up, <laughs> start beginning to blow a gale, and but that's right, the mind inside is gentle. It just uh, sway, sways gently and. Uh, uh, and, and doesn't uh, d doesn't react too much to those outs outside situations, out outside circumstances. Um, I was talking about kindfulness before, as Ajahn Brahm was saying, and uh, uh, it's in indeed the uh, the practice of mindfulness is, uh, or as Ajahn Sujata has recently translated it as the the, the mindful mindfulness meditations. Uh, this is again, yeah, it's, it's, it's a quality, quality that you can take with you. Uh, I, suppose it, I suppose in particular if you're 
in the workplace. You can apply that, that uh, sharp, clear mind to uh, whatever you need to get done that day and uh, to do a good job, to have that, uh, uh, keep your bosses happy and <laughs> make sure you can pay the bills and stuff. And uh, um, it goes on and on. But generally within this, these, uh, this, this framework of the Buddha, it's uh, um, the Eightfold Path, the gradual training. Uh, they, all, they all come together with these um, qualities, making peace, be kind, be gentle. I know Ajahn Brahm talks a lot about patience as well. Um, patience in the suttas was described by the Buddha as being the, uh, the, the highest, highest austerity, the highest spiritual practice. Um, and uh, it's just that, it's practice. So we practice being patient. Um, when we're standing in line at the uh, shopping centre, uh, uh, we might have a few people in front of us, but we're not really disturbed, you know. We just, we just sit there and relax, and when it's our turn, uh, we step up and we can, uh, we can buy, our, <laughs> buy our groceries. Um, and uh, a lot of these things are outward. Um, uh, uh, what I've been talking about is our outward attitudes, these, uh, the way these inner qualities uh, allow us to deal with the out external uh, world around us. Uh, yeah. And essentially, essentially it is the, uh, uh, it is our karma, it is our karma that we really carry around with us, that provides us with the, uh, um, our happiness and suffering throughout the day, throughout our lives. Um, so I think that, uh, yeah, karma very much is the, uh, is, is the movable feast. Karma is the mo movable feast. It's something that you carry with you uh, from life to life. It's, uh, the, yeah, it, 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 it's, a, it, it's here for you now and it's here... Um, and when we pass on to the next uh, next realm. Mm. And, and the weight of that karma uh, is often uh, uh, the good, the, the the good karma that we make is uh, uh, no burden at all. The Buddha described it as like your uh, your shadow following you. All of these good deeds, so um, they all uh, they're, they're no weight at all. Whereas the uh, uh, if we make bad karma, it's more like you know this sort of cart we carry around like the ox drags. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we might have to deal with that a little bit at times because we've all got uh, a mixture of uh, 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 a mixture of karma from the past. We all do. That would be good. Okay, I, th I think I, I think I've spoken as much as I can on that topic, but uh, perhaps we can uh, uh, spend a few minutes before the before the shared meal. We can um, just have a few questions and answers. It's uh, it's a good way to be. Just just excuse me. I'll just adjust my legs. So, <laughs> does anyone have any uh, uh, questions or uh, comments or uh, any stories you'd like to tell? I don't know. <laughs> hmm. Quiet. I might start the first question. Please, yes. Yeah. 
Alvin seemed very amazing. I mean, obviously, you're not the first Westerner monks to uh, to become uh, first Western to become a monk, but from your background, who are not uh, from the Buddhist traditions or from the Buddhist family, hmm. what make you inspired to take the big step to become monastic? Right. Okay. Yeah, that's the uh, <laughs> that's the same question that Rasika's son asked this morning. It's you know what. Why did I become a monk? And it's it's always uh, it always seems to be just a number of uh, uh, nudges into the uh, into the right direction. So I think uh, I can probably think back as far as my university days in Perth when I um, uh, did a few sessions of yoga. Again, you know, just stressed out, uh, a bit a bit uh, anxious and, and that sort of thing. So uh, tried a bit of yoga. Just uh, was it hatha yoga? I think just just stretching in that. But at the end of the end of the sessions, we'd lie down uh, with our head on the uh, bolster and just uh, relax and let and listen to some uh, sort of Buddhist chanting uh, in the sort of Tibetan style. So not not like <laughs> it be so. Uh, and I found that really really relaxing. I I really enjoyed that part of it uh, more than the rest of it. Uh, and it was later. Uh, I'm glad to go. I gave you the whole story of where I've been. So now you know where I am. So when I was working as a programmer in Melbourne later on, uh, I was working for a company called Civica up in Hoddle Street, and they produced library systems. Uh, so like you know, book library systems, um, and they had a game every week, every Friday. They would um, one of the pe one of the employees would have a have a game, and I think uh, one week. So sometimes it was like. Uh, we'd all sit, do some painting or we'd um, do some squeeze box dancing and <laughs> that sort of thing. But one time this this woman uh, uh, actually sat, sat us down and uh, we did a guided meditation. Uh, it was just body sweeping, I think. Might even be um, Goenka style. I don't know actually now. I, at the time I wasn't familiar at all. Um, and uh, yeah, so we did like just a half an hour guided meditation, just sweep, uh, just uh, body sweeping. So for those who don't know what body sweeping is, uh, it's a common technique in meditation to just uh, uh, go from one part of the body to the next, um, just just being mindful, mindfully aware of that part of the body, relaxing it, like the, from the toes up to the tip of the uh, top of the head, that sort of thing. And uh, yeah, that was I found that again. Uh, Deeply relaxing. So when I was at the end of my um, end of my stay in Melbourne, at the end of my tether, you might say, <laughs> um, yeah, I was quite stressed out and uh, wanted to relax. So of course, I was interested in meditation um, at that point, or I'd, or I'd at least got interested in meditation. So when I started meditating, I found um, that it actually did it did actually. Uh, help me cultivate these these uh, sort of calmer mind, a happier happier. Well, in, in the beginning, calmer, uh, uh, a, a bit more relaxed, and uh, uh, there's that sense of happiness there too, which is really important. So, uh, if you feel a bit of uh, uh, happiness, what they call that pity pity in the uh, in the Pali, the the joy in the meditation, and that always gives you. Um, more incentive to continue on. So uh, by the time I got back to Perth, I was already uh, quite enthusiastic about the meditation side of things, uh, and I'd also had a chance to listen a little bit to Ajahn Brahm um, and other teachers at, uh, on the on the website, mostly Ajahn Brahm. Uh, and it all, I think, the way Ajahn Brahm presents uh, Dhamma to a uh, uh, I think to everyone really, to a, to a completely diverse community with Thais, Sri Lankans, Westerners. Uh, a lot of our monks are from Europe. Uh, nor, you know, nor, we've got Norwegians, Swiss, uh, German, English, uh, all over the place. But I think Ajahn Brahm uh, has a way of teaching to uh, each of these, each culture, each person. And uh, so it didn't take very much. Once, uh, once I'd uh, developed a bit of meditation and uh, had the enthusiasm about the t the teachings uh, and uh, not much motivation to go back to being a programmer. 
Although I did, I did, I did have an enjoyable six months working at Motorola here. Oh, back in Perth before I ordained, because I had to pay off my bills. But uh, it was quite a nice time. It was a nice time. Uh, yeah, I used to. I didn't do that many hours. I was getting paid quite well. I didn't need that much money, so I used to go for walks along the the river and uh, the Swan River and uh, have a nice meal down there. Walk through the the grounds of Un University of Western Australia. Uh, and at this point, uh, yeah, no, I was very keen about um, becoming a monk. I only heard one talk, as I said, just uh, a guy called Ajahn Chandako, uh, who's in New Zealand now. Um, I don't know that he's like a super duper teacher, but it was enough just to say, yeah, you know, this is really interesting. These teachings are really interesting. Um, not just on a sort of uh, dogmatic level, but also on an intellectual level as well. It's this, uh, when you start reading the suttas, um, uh, like the uh, Majjhima Kai is a good place to start. Uh, you, st you start taking it apart and trying to understand it and how uh, it might reflect on a modern Western lifestyle. Um, yeah, but yeah, no, I did an I did end up doing a nine-day retreat with Ajahn Shatamalo, and uh, by that stage, I'm like, yes, really want to become a monk. After nine days, I, th I thought this is really cool. So I done nine days of. Uh, reasonably intensive meditation. This is before Jhana Grove was built as well, so uh, I think uh, this is at the Redemptorist, uh, uh, was it, uh, some strain of uh, Christian monasticism, but it's it's uh, not nearly as nice as uh, <laughs> Jhana Grove. But anyway, after nine, nine days of intensive practice, I was like, yeah, let's let's do it. So um, so yeah, I did. I uh, I. Uh, Applied to, I sent Ajahn Brahm a letter. I said, "Can I come and become an Anagarika?" He said, "Yeah, sure. Do I uh, do what you normally do, which is to uh, spend a month in the monastery, unordained, and that was enjoyable too. So uh, yeah, I was quite happy. So, but then by June, yeah, I took Anagarika ordination. Yeah. So uh, there you go. That's the long answer to your question, Adrian. <laughs> Has anyone else got any questions? I'll ask a question. Please. So, so there were some difficulties that you experienced that took you into monistic life. Mm -hmm. um, so in the monistic life, there must be also difficulties. So what are the types of difficulties that you really experienced in monistic life? Oh, the difficulties in monistic life. Okay. Just a moment. Um, <laughs> I guess... I guess one of the things is when you when you first get there and you're an Anagarika, <laughs> you, you take take ordination as an eight pre preceptor wearing white shaved head. You have to work really hard. <laughs> Bodhni Han is a busy monastery, <laughs> so I, I, at the time I didn't like driving. So uh, um, I, I think I got my P plates while I was in Melbourne, um, but I hardly ever drove. And I got there and Ashton Bob's like, oh well, maybe you should get your license. So, all right, I went to the <laughs> went to the motor vehicles place, and they said, "Oh, you've had your your P's long enough. You can have a proper license now." <laughs> and I spent, you know, uh, the better part of two years driving monks around. It's a huge amount of work, and uh, and uh, getting up early in the morning to prepare the breakfast and uh, uh, for the monks and uh, all that sort of stuff. So, uh, in the beginning, yeah, it's it quite a lot of work. Um, uh, and then I suppose the other side of things is uh, there are times when there's absolutely nothing to do. <laughs> and that's a challenge in itself, especially around the... Um, uh, pardon me. Around the rains retreat. Uh, around, uh, yeah, so from usually July through to October. It's a three-month period of... Uh, more intensive practice there, and there's really very you you find yourself with very little to do. Uh, you have uh, a minimum of chores. Uh, we all have separate huts there, on uh, uh, which we go back to. We don't have sort of communal, we don't sort of get together to have coffee or anything like that after the meal. We um, uh, generally keep to ourselves. So, um, just learning how to deal deal with that amount of uh, solitude, with that amount of uh, um, time to which if you <laughs> if you can apply it to the meditation is great but otherwise it can be um, uh, quite challenging uh, there was, was a nice quote I heard was it was a nice phrase one used I said there's a there's a difference between solitude and isolation so 
Well, it's possible to have both in a monastery. Uh, we do. I mean, and uh, I suppose part of it as well is uh, because I mean, before I before I came to the monastery, I had uh, uh, a fairly reasonable amount of um, loneliness in my life. I'd say you know, I'd, uh, it was it was just something that was uh, part of my life for a long time and. Uh, Really, only ended when I started it, uh, started life as a monastic, which is weird, right? So you start, <laughs> you start spending lots of time by yourself, and uh, the loneliness goes away. But that's um, more because of the people you're with than the actual seclusion. But it does take time. It does take time to uh, settle into to a community um, and to uh, make friends and um, uh, sort of uh, feel part of the group. I think one of the most important things that a, uh, a monk can do, especially a senior monk, is to uh, make the people feel welcome when they come to a monastery, whether they're lay people or whether they're new monks or new um, new anagarikas. Um, so, yeah, I think to make people welcome, to encourage them, you're sort of cultivating the opposite. You're cultivating uh, uh, the opposite of loneliness, really. So. Um, in that sense, that was difficult at the beginning, um, but after a while it sort of fades away. Um, yeah. What else is difficult about monastic life? I'm sure there's plenty of, plenty of difficulty, like not enough hot water in the middle of, middle of winter. <laughs> Although the, 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 the situation up at Newbury is pretty good, actually. It's a... Uh, uh, is it, it gets very cold there, I'm told, but it's been reasonably pleasant for the last um, 10 or so days uh, or more. Uh, I think we've got a cold front coming through, but those, but at least the, um, the rooms here are very comfortable at the moment. It is just sort of an old uh, motel lodge sort of thing, but so it's kind of like a bedroom really, it's not a real curtie. But it's warm, it's simple, um, and uh, yeah, so far, <laughs> anyway. And I think with the um, the new building project that we're uh, getting on with, uh, I think the new new cooties sound like they'll be very well made. Um, and uh, even in the, uh, the icy winters when we have our uh, rains retreat, um, I think they'll be nice and warm. So at least we can uh, have refuge inside. We can uh, enjoy our meditation while the snow piles up outside. <laughs> I don't think there's that much snow, but um, yeah. So um, uh, I think yeah, f Bodhinyana is a very comfortable mon monastery, so it's not too difficult physically. Uh, there's huge amounts of food and a huge variety. If you want to be, you know, raw vegan or you just want to eat Thai food, it's or Sri Lankan food, it's <laughs> it's it's all there. Um, and uh, because of Ajahn Brahm, there's never really any shortage of anything that you might need. Uh, and I don't think it's just Ajahn Brahm, he's, but the uh, community that is cultivated there, it's, uh, yeah, it's comfortable and, uh, and it is welcoming. Uh, uh, the monks are very, 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 very high caliber, very good, very good people. So, um, I guess <laughs> probably probably one of the difficulties that the Buddha de described in the suttas was where, he, where uh, you know, you've come to a realization that life is is full of suffering. It's like ah, I now want enlightenment, <laughs> and it's like oh, this could take a while. <laughs> so you, yeah, being able to apply yourself uh, with persistence over uh, uh, not just the nine days of a of a retreat, but over the years. Um, uh, but again, the, the rewards for that far outweigh the, uh, the difficulties that you might have. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, your parents, uh, how they have taken a, uh, how do they react to your decision to become a Buddhist monk? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, well, um, I think, uh, right, so that was, okay, so at the time when I moved from, when I was living in Melbourne and then moved to Perth, um, they knew I was having all sorts of difficulties, going through divorce, going through a divorce and, uh, which was not difficult, it was very amicable, bit of paperwork, 
<laughs> um, but uh, they knew that I was uh, um, having troubles and stuff. And when I <laughs> when I said that I wanted to be a monk, he said, he said, Oliver, you got to stop messing around. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but at the end of the day, my parents are very supportive, and uh, uh, they've never been a particularly they've never been particularly controlling, for better or worse. Maybe they should have controlled me a little bit more. But uh, in the end, uh, they became very uh, they they saw that this is uh, doing really good things for me. They're not Buddhists themselves. They're not don't, they're not really religious. But um, uh, basically. After a short while, they became very, very supportive, and nowadays they're just, yeah, they just, they're, they're more than happy that I'm a monk. Uh, yeah, no, they're always they, they, they visit uh, Bodhinyana regularly. Um, they wanted to come to see Newbury, but um, just couldn't make it. They've got, they've got some renovations going on at home, uh, but perhaps next time I come to Victoria, they might come and visit. And they visited me in what Bodhidharma as well. And they visited me <laughs> in Sri Lanka as well when I did my four months there. So after four months, when I'm rather skinny and <laughs> looking forward to going home, I had a week with my family. Uh, my parents met me in Kandy, so uh, I, I, I made the trip with another monk from uh, from from Nauiana, which is sort of central uh, central c center of the island, really, sort of west of east of Kurunegla. Got to Candy and saw my mum and dad had a in the nice hotel there. That was it, the Earls Regency there. Very nice hotel, and um, they had a room for me, which was very comfortable. And uh, we spent a week uh, just travelling around Sri Lanka with the tour guide. So um, that was wonderful. We saw the tea fields, and we saw the elephants at Udawalawe, and <laughs> we saw the beaches of Gaul, which are very beautiful uh, and filled with. Uh, cemeteries <laughs> because of the, the tsunami that came through but it's all very idyllic um, and yeah so my parents are really on board actually that once they figure out that uh, you know I'm enjoying myself and I'm no burden on them at all um, uh, it's more like they they're asking me for things they can help with uh, yeah they're, they're very good and I think um, yeah when I get back they'll they want to organise another uh, house dana with a few monks to come and stay, come and visit as well. So, yeah, very supportive and uh, yeah, making a lot of good karma along the way, which makes me very happy as well. <laughs>